and welcome to Ipsa Dixit, the podcast on legal scholarship. I'm your host, Brian L. Fry, Spears Gilbert Associate Professor of Law at the University of Kentucky College of Law. My guest is Pamela R. Metzger, Director of the Deason Criminal Justice Reform Center and Professor of Law at SMU Dedman School of Law. We will discuss her article, Criminal Disappearance, which she co-authored with Janet C. Hofel, and which will be published in the George Washington Law Review. So welcome to the show, Pam. Hi, thanks for having me. Oh, the pleasure is all mine. I'm really glad you reached out because I have to tell you that I found what you describe in this paper absolutely outrageous, and I had no idea that this was happening. Um, and I can't, I still can't believe that this is happening because it's so unconscionable. Um, but for listeners who probably haven't had a chance to read the paper yet, I wonder if you could start the interview by just telling the story of Jessica Josh, which you begin your article with, because I mean, I don't know how anyone can hear that story and not be totally appalled. Sure. Um, it, it is in fact an appalling story. Um, Jessica Josh is, um, driving along one day in Mississippi where she lives and she gets pulled over by police who run a warrant check and they tell her that there's a drug felony warrant out on her in Choctaw County, Mississippi. Um, this is the first Ms. Josh has heard of it. Um, they take her into jail in Choctaw um, and she gets there and like anyone else, she expects that all those warnings she got, you know, you have the right to an attorney, all those Miranda warnings are going to mean something. And so she says, well, when am I going to court? When can I see the charges? When can I see a judge? And this is rural Choctaw County. And the jailer says, well, we have terms of court here. You know, the judge comes, you know, once every few months. And so uh, you'll see a judge in August when the next term of court starts. Now, this is April when this happens. So imagine that you're driving along on your way home one day. The police stop you. And the next thing you know, you're whisked away to another county uh, where you're told that there's an indictment against you. And you'll be able to talk to somebody about all of this when, eh, three, four months probably. Um, and what's really stunning about this is that um, Ms. Josh, again, has no idea that these charges are ever filed. Um, she has money from friends who are willing to put up bail. And she says, please let me see a judge and put bail up. And the, you know, the sheriff, jailer says, can't help you. When she finally has her first court appearance, and she's arrested April 26th, July 31st is the first time she sees a judge, the very first time. And the judge sets her bond and appoint, appoints a lawyer to represent her. Six days later, she's out of jail. She spent 96 days in jail, 90 of them without ever seeing a judge or a lawyer. She gets a lawyer, she's out, and then her lawyer does this magic thing that lawyers do and reviews the evidence. And it turns out that the so-called evidence of this drug sale is nothing. There's no evidence that she's doing anything more than borrowing $40 from someone who used to be a friend. And the state drops the charges. And, and what's, you know, what's emotionally compelling to most people is, oh, she was innocent. And so in some ways, the story always kind of makes me uncomfortable because what we really ought to be most outraged about is that we have a system in this country that disappears people. If we were looking at this sequence of events in any other nation in the world, we would be pointing our fingers and talking about human rights violations because literally police can pick you up and disappear you because there's no judge available to hear the case or because court doesn't sit for another few days or weeks or months. And there's no constitutional law that prevents it. So, so Pam, please tell me that what happened to Jessica Josh was like an aberration, like something really out of the ordinary where the existing systems broke down and the protections we have against incarcerating people without any due process just didn't work the way they were supposed to. Is, is that right? Or does this happen more often than we want to believe? I think it happens so much more often than we want to believe. Um, and, and we're actually at the center, we're actually working on getting evidence of this. We're doing some some looking at jail rosters and, and detention, but you don't have to look at jail rosters and court records to know that it happens a lot. There are actually two really excellent sources of information. 
One is case law. And you can find case after case after case, mostly of courts saying that there's no remedy. Um, Jessica Josh is unusual. Her case goes to the United States Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals, and they find that her rights have been violated. And she's awarded $250,000 in damages. But I've got cases that we found where people are being awarded a thousand dollars, a dollar a day, a hundred dollars a day. I've got cases that we've found where judges have held that your constitutional rights aren't violated if you are held only, and I'm putting the word only in scare quotes, if you could see me, only 40 days without seeing a judge or a lawyer, um, because ultimately you pled guilty. And so, you know, a- any injury is sort of wiped away. Uh, by the guilty plea. So the habeas claims are almost inevitably unsuccessful um, because they're post-conviction habeas claims and and the plea wipes any preceding error. And the civil actions are really convoluted, but generally, one, there's no clearly established constitutional law on the topic, and two, doctrines of immunity. Um, They sort of combine to to make this an, an almost unremediable problem. So we have this case law that suggests that this is happening a lot. Um, And then we have reports by folks who go in and study justice systems. Um, David Carroll and the Sixth Amendment Center come most prominently to mind here, where they're going in and they're looking at public defense. And in, in the course of those examinations, come away saying, well, wait a minute, here's a county where the norm is that you spend 10 days in jail before you see a judge. And, and in rural pockets of our country in particular, this is an enormously difficult problem uh, to combat. Well, I mean, how can it possibly be consistent with constitutional due process guarantees to be detaining people who haven't really been formally charged with anything at all, who are just being picked up by the police and taken to jail? How can that be? Well, that's an excellent question. Um, you know, I, t- I tend to write um, articles about things that outrage me. Um, and th- this is definitely an outrage article, right? A- and I think that what's going on here is two things. Um, one is is the Supreme Court's sort of um, very, very, very rigid adherence to this idea that the Fourth Amendment I- encompasses all of the constitutional protection that you're entitled to in these early stage proceedings. And so that anything related to the arrest, anything related to your pretrial detention somehow falls under the Fourth Amendment umbrella. And that's closely related to the Supreme Court's um, real fear of using the due process clause in the criminal justice context. The court takes this rigid textualist approach that says, if there's something that's textually committed to another amendment, you don't use the due process clause, you use that amendment. And so the courts have have often, not always, but often said, this is a Fourth Amendment problem. Um, It goes back, you know, for people who are super criminal procedure nerds like me, it goes back to a case called Gerstein versus Pugh, which is a very early case about the rights of people to see judges and have probable cause determinations made. And you've got this group of prisoners in Florida who say, hey, we've been sitting here for weeks. We've never seen a judge. And the Supreme Court says, well, the Fourth Amendment requires that if there's no warrant for your arrest, somebody promptly make a probable cause determination. And the petitioners are kind of reaching for more. And they say, well, we'd also like a hearing and a lawyer and all these things that we expect to be getting now that we've been arrested. And the court says, yeah, you're not entitled to that. No one who got arrested with an arrest warrant got any of that. So you don't get it either. And the court just goes farther than it has to go, I think, and stakes out this position that the Fourth Amendment probable cause determination is the only protection you're entitled to. Why? Well, because all the other good stuff that you think you're getting, that's going to come when you get your trial. So this is all going to work itself out. And it just doesn't. And the court sort of knows it doesn't. I mean, about 20 years later in County of Riverside, the court has to step in and say, you got to make a probable cause determination in 48 hours. But the court never ties that to any other procedural rights. And they say the Fourth Amendment just gives you this ex parte probable cause determination. Um, my own opinion is it's a disconnect. The Supreme Court doesn't really understand what's happening in state courts. Um, they have this kind of naive expectation that 
that there's all kinds of procedure coming and that they don't need to get involved in, in setting constitutional limits. Um, I guess the other thing I'll say is you actually had two thoughts there. You said, how is it possible that people get arrested and, and held all this time without seeing a judge? And how is it possible that they get arrested and held when they haven't been formally charged? So the other dirty little secret about these early stages in the criminal justice system is that there's also no constitutional law on how long you can be held after a valid arrest before the prosecution decides whether it's keeping the case. And this is this paper is one of a series of papers I'm working on on early stage criminal procedure. And the, and the reality is that there's no constitutional limit on how long you can be held. And there are lots and lots of states where you can be held indefinitely. There's no statutory limit on how long you can be held after arrest while prosecutors are deciding whether your case is a keeper. That's also got to be a due process violation, but that's the next paper. Yeah, I mean, it just seems bizarre to me that we would that the court would say that the probable cause standard is sufficient because it doesn't seem like the probable cause analysis has anything to do with the kind of due process concerns we'd have related to detaining someone for a long period of time, especially the, of the duration that you're talking about. I mean, how can that possibly be right? Oh, I, I think it's wrong. Which is part of the argument in the paper, but but I think the other thing you got you got to understand here is that the court is so afraid of of using due process. And it's so afraid of this idea that they're going to create too much procedure. And again, my fingers are making little square quotes here. But the idea that there's too much procedure, they'll be slowing things down in courts. The other piece is that, um, you know, th there is a, an alternate line of cases, right? You've got the um, due process law coming out of the Salerno case, which is the one Supreme Court case that's got any kind of modern resonance on, on bail and pretrial release. But even that case, doesn't particularly address the the underlying procedural gap because there there's the question of um, I guess what I would call kickstarting criminal procedure. So the court seems to be much more comfortable using due process once there's a judge and something's happening, right? And you can take this kind of procedural due process inquiry and say whatever this moment was in court was there procedural due process. Where I think they really get stuck is this idea that after an arrest, you have rights that are not attached to any particular court proceeding. And in many cases, depending on the state and the way that the system is structured, no particular charge. And so you've got this kind of black hole. Um, you know, there are federal circuit courts that have agreed that there's a due process right, and they're actually split on whether it lies in substantive or procedural due process. But, you know, the Supreme Court has been remarkably reluctant to delve into this. I mean, but but I also have to say, you know, I, I don't know what's in each of the justices' minds. I can tell you that there's another piece of this that is the Supreme Court persistently misunderstanding its own precedent. Um, there have been twice in major criminal procedure decisions, once in Salerno and once recently in a, in a case called Manuel versus Joliet, which was just a couple terms ago, where you have Supreme Court justices asserting that the rule that you have to have a probable cause determination within 48 hours of your arrest, if you're on a warrantless arrest, means that you have to have your initial appearance in court within those 48 hours. That's just not the law, but you have Scalia making that mistake in County of Riverside, and you have Alito making it in this recent case. And Alito does say in his dissent, and it gives me cause for hope, that he's perplexed at how anyone could say that the due process clause is not involved. He's very perplexed at how the Fourth Amendment seizure provision can, in fact, apply not just to arrest, but to all of your pretrial detention. Um, and there's some healthy skepticism there. But it is problematic, and, and the problem sort of persists in part because the law on immunity and the law on habeas make it very difficult for these cases when they are litigated to get up and out of the state courts and into the federal courts. Mm. Well, so Pam, I'm, I, mean, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about – sorry – I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how people are harmed 
when they're held in this way in like pre-trial or really pre-appearance at all sort of detention. Um, I mean, obviously just being detained alone is a pretty serious harm, but are there other kinds of harms that people experience under these circumstances? Sure. I mean, the most obvious one, um, and I think the one that is probably the most impactful in terms of the, the criminal case, is that your right to counsel attaches at the initial appearance in court. Now, I'm, I'm emphasizing the word attaches because that doesn't mean you get a lawyer then, but the right attaches. And so until you've had that moment in court, you're not going to get a lawyer. Because you don't have a lawyer, there's no one who could be investigating the case, no one to argue your bail, sometimes no one to tell your family where you are. So you have all the collateral consequences that come with being detained, loss of job, loss of employment, exposure to violence, exposure to all kinds of illness, right? psychological harm, separation from family, and your chance to defend yourself effectively is just dwindling day by day by day. You can take an easy example. Um, if, if I'm arrested and charged with robbing a convenience store, unless somebody preserves the security video within 24 or 48 hours, it's gone. They're going to tape right over it. Um, and, and not only can I not do anything about that from the jail, but because I've had no initial appearance in court, my right to counsel hasn't sprung into existence. There's no imminent appointment of counsel, and there's nobody that's going to go grab that, that tape. Now, that's a problem even in early initial appearance cases because of the right to counsel piece, but it cascades. And one of the impacts is if you're held long enough and you get to court, and then as it is in most cases, there's still not even a lawyer there. There's a very strong inclination to just go ahead and plead to get out of jail that day if you can. And so there are shocking numbers of people who plead guilty at their initial appearance in court, um, often without any lawyer at all. And some piece of that is undoubtedly connected to the impact of having been essentially disappeared into a jail cell without any judge or any lawyer. I think it's very difficult for people to be willing to go back. So they plead guilty right there, right then. So you think, I mean, at least one effect of this kind of pre-appearance, in many cases, almost like indefinite detention, is effectively to coerce people into guilty pleas that they wouldn't otherwise be willing to make? Oh, I think I think there's no question of that. I mean, I, and, and again, there are lots of other reasons that that's happening. But I think in, in these delayed first appearance cases, there is no question that what you have seen, if you're a defendant, intentionally or unintentionally, is the state flexing its enormous muscle, right? And so conceptually, the, the reason that there's a judge that stands between you and the police is because, I mean, this goes back to your conversation with Dan Epps, right? But it's because there's a someone who mediates the state power over its citizens. And in this case, it's a judge. If the judge never shows up or the judge's appearance is delayed, the message you're getting as a defendant is that the police have enormous power to pick you up and hold you with no mediation by a judge. There's no one standing between you and the police state. And the thought for many people that they're going to go back to jail and wait again is intolerable. So, so Pam, I, I can't help but wondering whether – to the extent that it's thought about this question at all, the Supreme Court really understands what's actually happening on the ground in local jurisdictions in relation to pre-appearance detention. And I guess by extension, like to what extent do other judges, whether it's lower federal court judges or state court judges, really have a handle on what the police and the jails and so on are really doing as a practical matter to detain people with little or no due process or oversight. So I, I guess I'll tell you that the farther you are from the ground, the less you understand of this problem. Um, the Supreme Court, I think, does not get it at all. And, um, you know, Justice Scalia certainly misunderstood um, what the situation was. Um, that's his dissent in County of Riverside, where he says, you know, how is an innocent person ever going to explain to the judge that they're innocent if they can't get into court for 48 hours? And of course, County of Riverside isn't about getting into court. 
It's about having a judge make an ex parte probable cause determination. You know, you fast forward, County of Riverside is 91 or 93. You fast forward to two years ago, in a, or three years ago, in a case called Manuel versus City of Joliet, and you've got the Supreme Court talking about a man who was arrested after the police falsified not just the arrest data, but, but a lab report. And he brings suit and the Supreme Court says, well, you don't have a due process claim here. You've got a Fourth Amendment claim only because the Fourth Amendment was explicitly tailored for the criminal justice system. And it defines, and I'm just quoting here, the process that is due for seizures of persons in criminal cases. And so the this is the Supreme Court three years ago. The Fourth Amendment governs a, governs a claim for unlawful pretrial detention even beyond the start of legal process. That's two years ago. I, I think the court just has no conception. Um, if you go to the appellate courts, I think some of the courts are aware of the problem. And you, we are now seeing some courts refer to this as a problem of over-detention. And almost every circuit has looked at it um, in one context or another. I, I think on the ground level, I think local judges know this is happening. They do. I think they either think it's all right or that there's nothing they can do about it. Um, the, the problem, again, we don't have perfect data on this. Like, you know, We don't have great data on who's in jail, let alone what for and when they saw a court. But, but what we do know from the case law and from looking at, at some fairly comprehensive reports of different criminal justice systems is that the problem predominates in rural jurisdictions. And many of those places, when you, when you talk to folks about what's going on, the answer is we don't have any choice. The judge is riding circuit um, or the judge is only part time or we're 100 miles away from the nearest courthouse. Um, so I, I do think that at the local level, people understand this is happening. Um, that there's also something really powerful about the it's always been this way argument. And it's very difficult to dislodge people from that. Um, there's been some movement. Jesse Smith in North Carolina, Andy Davis up in New York State. He's now at the Decent Center. But when he was there, you know, they're all doing work on projects, putting counsel in at first appearance. And as part of that process, you get a conversation going about how long is it until you get your first appearance. But I think I think at the appellate level and certainly at the Supreme Court level, they don't get it. Well, so one thing I could I can't help but wonder is, I mean, do you think that these kinds of detentions without any sort of due process protections are simply a sort of function of a system that's breaking down with sort of lack of communication and sort of like sort of institutional problems that sort of prevent the system from working efficiently and fairly? Or is there like something intentional going on here? Are like are like the police and the jails and the justice system in general doing this on purpose as maybe a way of like coercing people into pleas or just because they can, or is it some combination of the two? Like what's, what do you think the right way to understand this as kind of a social phenomenon is? The answer is really yes to all of the above. There are a lot of different things happening. One is there's no structural incentive to get people into court in a timely manner. Um, Prosecutors aren't paying for the jail days. Judges aren't paying for the jail days. So they don't have a structural incentive. Um, in many, many places, it has always been done this way. And therefore, it's very hard to contemplate that the way it's always been done has always been unjust, which makes kind of rethinking the process hard. I think there is a segment of um, the police and prosecutor community that does use this as a mechanism to coerce pleas. Um, we're doing some studies in prosecutor offices around the country um, in mid-sized jurisdictions. And there's one office where they tell us flat out, nobody pleads from the street. And they mean to say, we got to hold people in jail or they're not going to plead guilty. So there's some of that happening. Um, there's some of that in policing, particularly when you think about how long it takes prosecutors to make a formal charge. Um, I had a case in Louisiana where um, 
they have 60 days after arrest to decide whether they're going to make a formal charge. And I had a DA tell me, my cop's mad at, at your client. He's going to do it 60 days before I drop the case. You know, I think all of the above is happening. And I think that um, particularly in rural areas, it's very difficult to imagine what the alternative is. Well, so Pam, I mean, what do you think the procedure should look like, ideally, from like a formal perspective. I mean, you know, if we're going to try to meaningfully protect due process under these circumstances, how should how ought courts to look at this question and determine whether due process is being meaningfully provided and and respected? Yeah, so I think that's a tough one, and, I, and it's tough for me because um, there's, there's a temptation to look to technology here. So my inclination is you should be in touch with the court early and often. And, you know, the next article in this series is you should have a right to counsel early and often. Um, And so I think it's really difficult for me to imagine a scenario that would that would be a fix that doesn't involve very prompt communication with the court. And if necessary, by video, Um, I'm cringing as I'm saying that because we don't understand a lot about the relationship between in-person appearances and outcomes. What we do understand is um, highly suggestive of the idea that you need to be present um, because if you're not present, there are going to be consequences. One way we know that, um, there are some studies, some of them are older, but that, that people who are doing remote bail hearings, when the defendant is remote, um, particularly where the judge is in the courtroom and the lawyer is in the courtroom, they fare worse on bail amounts substantially. So video appearances promptly is probably a partial solution. Um, Early, early access to counsel, I think is essential, but there's a, there's another sort of more radical way of thinking about it. Um, And I think this, this is my gut about where the answer lies, although I don't think it's where the courts are going to go. My gut is, is that the case you're prosecuting, the case you're arresting and prosecuting on isn't important enough for a judge to get on his or her horse and ride to do the hearing, then it's probably not important enough to be detaining somebody on. And and there's a piece of me that really believes that, that the cure for this is only going to come if we begin to consecrate the lack of process um, with an assumption that you're not giving process because you don't care enough about the case, um, which is a pretty heavy hammer. But But I think that to me, you know, that that is the most compelling way to understand the problem. Because I, I guarantee you that if there was a rule that says you see a judge within 24 hours or you cannot be detained, there would be a way to get a judge to court to meet people on really serious cases. Well, so presumably these kind of really deep doctrinal changes are going to be slow if they come at all. And obviously I I hope they do, but it doesn't sound like the Supreme Court and lower courts are in a big hurry to start implementing them. To the extent that local officials and prosecutors and judges care about this, are there things kind of in the short term or in the meantime that they can do to help mitigate these kinds of problems? Yeah, there are. I mean, I think there are local procedural rules. I think the most effective ones, again, consequate noncompliance. So um, you have lots and lots of places where the statutes could be amended or the criminal procedure rules could be amended to require an initial appearance before a judge within 24 hours or 48 hours. Um, The question then, of course, becomes, do you allow it um, by video conferencing, which is, again, I think a very poor second best. Uh, You can also, I think, think about intermediate remedies that while they won't cure the problem, they might be appropriate remedies um, to kind of really create some prophylactics. So I I could imagine, for example, a universe where if you're held more than a certain amount of time without an initial appearance, if you have a jury trial, the burden of proof changes. Or if you have a jury trial, there's an instruction, just like you have a missing witness charge. Maybe you get a charge that says this person was held in communicado for this number of days and you should weigh that in assessing, you know, the government's proof and the, and the fact that the defendant was deprived of an opportunity to mount a defense. Now, you know, if anyone's going to make those rulings, well, I'd also be president. But um, I think there are more creative approaches to, to, to incentivizing good behavior 
than we tend to be willing to use in constitutional law. So I think local statutes are great. I think local rules are great. I'm very encouraged by what I see the federal circuit courts doing, which is largely um, acknowledging, at least in, in when they acknowledge it, acknowledging that this is wrong, but still saying, well, we can't do anything about it. Um, just the acknowledgement that it's wrong is progress. Um, the other thing that really needs to happen is we need to take a very serious look at qualified immunity statutes. And states and localities should be very explicit about where the responsibility lies for guaranteeing the prompt initial appearance. Um, because there are places, in fairness to these, these local actors, there are places where these problems are not a result of statutory decisions or rules or indifference. Um, they're the result often of there being no clear lines of authority. So, you know, what's the sheriff supposed to do if the court doesn't show up? Well, but the court doesn't know there's a case because a piece of paper got lost. Um, there, there's very little clarity and therefore very little accountability. Well, Pam, thanks so much for coming on the show and talking about this really important paper. Um, I'm, I still am appalled by the fact that this is taking place and I'm, I'm really glad we were able to hopefully, um, raise some people's awareness to, to this problem. Well, thank you for having me. We should, we should all be outraged. session will you please stand first allow me to introduce myself my name is judge hundred years some people call me judge dread now i am from Ethiopia. try hard you rude boys for shooting black people in my court on the beat top Cause I'm Bex, and I am the root boy today. Who got this? Yes, sir. Root boy Adolphus Jakes. Yes, sir. Root boy Emmanuel Zachariah Zaki Palm. Present. George Robin Flea. Present. Hmm. Adolphus James. Yes, sir. I see where you have been charged. Ten shooting with intent. Five murder charge. Six grab and flee charge. What you are not guilty? Oh, sure. Guilty or not guilty? Not guilty, sir. I don't care what they say. Take 400 years. Stand down. Emmanuel Zachariah Zaki Palm. Yes, sir. You've been charged. 15 charge of shooting intent. 15 murder charge. And I heard that you was the one down there in Sutton Street who tell the judge. Root boys don't care. Well, this is King Street. And my name is Judge Dredd. And I don't care. Now take 400 years. I don't know why I'm going to say you know you're going to be Hush up, what they trying to do? Shoot me too? No, you're going to, but I didn't shoot the man. Well, quiet. 400 more years for you. Judge, grab and flee. Yes, sir. Stop your crying. Root boys don't cry. That's what I hear. I didn't read you, no, sir. I don't hear. Hush up. This is my court. You're charged for robbing school children. Robert aggravation. Good man, I not take my sentence. See you, my son. I is you shoot the man, you know. And I just tell him about the cafe. The judge come and come try, you know, son. I take my sentence for you, know, sir. Hush up. Hold up. That was James. Yes, sir. You rob school children. You boom the people's house. You shot black people. But you and I don't give you. Hush up. Just for talking, I know charge you for contempt. And that is a separate hundred years. I heard I sentence you to 400 years. 
I said, oh, shop, oh, shop. You are sentenced to 400 years and 500 lashes. I am going to set an example. I, good boys, don't cry, don't cry. When I was in Africa, I hear you were tough. Put a turn, take him away.